attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network. Um, I'd also want to recognize our co-sponsors for this webinar. Uh, we have Nick Weiner from Open Channels On, who's helping me co-moderate, and uh, openchannels.org is, is also co-sponsoring. Um, I want to welcome everyone here today. Uh, today's webinar is on the status of marine and coastal EBM among the network of U.S. federal programs. Uh, we have three presenters on with us today, Andrea Del Apa, uh, Frank Schwing, and Peg Brady from NOAA. Uh, also, uh, Ad, we wanted to credit Adam Fullerton, who was at NOAA at the time this work was done and participated in creating it. Um, and uh, so we, he may not be able to join us today, but we also wanted to give him credit. Okay, um, so before we get started with the presentation, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. So the Present, there'll be about 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the presentation for a question and answer. And uh, there's two ways to ask questions. You can type the question into the question panel of the user interface. Um, I'll then relay that to the presenters to answer. Um, you can go ahead and use this option anytime during the presentation or during the, the question and answer period. Um, it's fine. Um, and then the other way is during the actual question and answer period, you can raise your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon in your user interface. You press that, your hand, your virtual hand will go up, I'll see it, and I'll unmute you. Uh, this method of asking questions will only work if you have a working microphone or if you've called in on the telephone and have entered your PIN number. So anyway, we, we highly encourage questions and you can go ahead and send them in uh, through the question panel at any point. Okay. Well. Uh, Andrea, Peg, and Frank, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us. I'm Andrea De Lava. I'm uh, the NOAA Fisheries, actually in the Office of Habitat Conservation. But for doing this study, I was at the Office of Management and Budget under the supervision of Peg Brady during my Seagram Knaus Fellowship. And I'm here, as Sarah said, with Frank and Margaret, and actually Adam. Uh, He's not here, but he contributed to the this work. So first of all, I just, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, this is Peg Brady. Uh, I just want to also acknowledge that you see four names up here, but there's actually quite a number of folks that helped uh, assist in this effort. Uh, we have a uh, National Ocean Policy Interagency EBM team, and uh, as you'll see in some of the results that uh, Andrea is going to show us. Uh, a lot of those results were derived from their efforts, their work within their own agencies. So I want to take this step, uh, this, this moment, to acknowledge uh, our team members um, who uh, who continue to provide support to this effort. And of course, uh, Frank Schwing is here, uh, who also was uh, deeply involved in the development of this um, study as well. And a uh, shout out to the Sea Grant program, the Canals Fellowship. Uh, Andrea was a, um, a, a year-long uh, fellow within uh, NOAA Fisheries uh, on behalf of the uh, Sea Grant Canals uh, Fellowship Program. So uh, a, a lot of thanks go to the Sea Grant Program for their support. So I'll stop there. Frank, did you want to? Oh, good. OK. OK. So I would like to start by providing a little bit of background of the reason that uh, led us to conduct this study and what exactly it is uh, ecosystem-based management. So for um, now on, I will refer to simply by EBM. So you should all know that at least over the last 100 years, but probably even more than that, there has been a, an increase in the use of uh, marine natural resources and therefore also on the pressures that have been exerted on those resources. And uh, particularly, there's been an increase uh, in the influence of all the different human activities on these resources. On these, uh, resources. And uh, in these slides, there are just a picture that shows an example of uh, some of these many uh, very activities, such as fishery, fishing activities, or wind farming, or uh, uh, shipping, or uh, estuarine and coastal development. And uh, all of these activities are at some level had an impact on the marine ecosystem and also the condition and the services that they can provide uh, to human to human well-being. In uh, generally, we have manager, natural manager, are trying to address all those different uh, uh, activities and impact on a single species or a 
single sector uh, level. But the main problem and the shortcoming of this uh, conventional approach is that it doesn't consider for the natural and inherent uh, interlinking between all those different activities. And therefore, the next step uh, would be to uh, adopt and implement ecosystem based management, EBM, because it integrates across uh, all these uh, multiple sectors or activities. And also, it considers the entire ecosystems, including humans. For example, on the left, there is a figure that uh, depicts the Northeast Shelf Regional Ecosystem on the, along the Atlantic coast of the United States, with some example of those uh, uh, potential activities, such as fishery, aquaculture, oil and gas mining and extraction, uh, urban and coastal development. And therefore, there is a, a multiple series of activities that all together produce a, a series of synergistic effects on the status and uh, of the natural resources. And therefore, the main goal of EBM is to collectively manage the natural resources, included also considered as a habitat and species in a sustainable manner, but at the same time maintaining the ecosystem services to humans on the long-term horizon. And uh, EBM is characterized by a series of uh, important key elements, which are summarized here. First of all, is uh, based on science, is informed by science. Also, it considered for the connection and linkages between and within ecosystem, but at the same time, it considered for the social and economic uh, aspects of those systems. EBM also considered for the cumulative impacts of all these multiple activities. And uh, also considered for is based on uh, an ad adaptive management strategy, which means that the, the same EBM framework or strategies that are used for a particular uh, resource or a habitat, it may change over time uh, based on a series of reasons. For example, the scientific information provided, uh, they can uh, improve. Therefore, we have more uh, scientific information to perhaps slightly change or improve the EBM framework or strategy. But also, uh, this is also highlighted in the next bullet point, EBM considered for multiple objectives among services and sectors. And those uh, uh, objectives may change over time, also because the nature of the user or the stakeholders involved in the management of the resource uh, may change over time. And also, finally, uh, but last but not least, is the, in EBM, uh, an important aspect is the trade-off uh, evaluations which is important for uh, two main reasons, I think. Uh, the first one is that with trade-off evaluation, we can uh, uh, actually draw a list of the priority for a particular EBM uh, strategy or framework in a particular uh, regional area or project. And the second reason is that trade-off evaluation can be useful from a qualitative, uh, or in some cases, even better, from a quantitative perspective to try to understand if the uh, EBM framework or strategy that we are using is actually uh, working or not. Therefore, a way to integrate all those different key, key elements together will uh, let us come up with a, a pretty rough definition of EBM, which is a dynamic, adaptive, and iterative management approach that changes based on the spatial scale of the natural resource management. Now, despite the fact that there has been a, a, a broad interest in the use of EBM uh, in a marine and coastal environment, this is still uh, uh, a fairly new uh, strategy, management strategy, and uh, it draws mainly from uh, EBM approaches that have been used on land. So we're perhaps on the marine and coastal environment, we're kind of like uh, uh, lagging behind compared to land EBM, but we're getting closer. And uh, one issue is that there is still a, a, a limited systematic implementation of EBM in ocean and coastal uh, environment and ecosystem. And one of the main reasons is also because there is still a lack of knowledge or an understanding of what are the EBM uh, practices and principles. But despite this, uh, at least in the US, uh, uh, for the management of marine and coastal environment, we started to use uh, uh, and adopt uh, ecosystem-based framework and strategies. Let's say that from an uh, operational perspective, we start more uh, uh, consistently to talk and introduce EBM concepts uh, 
when uh, the Pew Ocean Commission in 2003 and uh, separately the United States Commission of Ocean Policy in 2004 both came to the same conclusion that basically in the way we were managing uh, uh, marine and coastal resources in the U.S. there was a, an absence of an integrated holistic management approach and both commission called for the uh, use of a comprehensive EVM framework uh, for the management of those resources. And therefore, following uh, this recommendation, the George W. Bush administration in 2004 issued an executive order, 13366, that basically developed an, uh, a committee on ocean policy that was charged with organizing a working group on science and technology and coordination to uh, move forward toward EVM for the management of marine and coastal resources. The main problem is that at that time uh, uh, they lack legislative mandates and funding to advance the policies that they were discussing about. And therefore, to move forward, uh, in 2009, uh, the Obama administration uh, uh, developed an interagency ocean policy task force that was charged with organizing a comprehensive policy approach for marine and uh, coastal management of natural resources through the implementation of an EBM framework. And uh, following these, uh, the same administration in 2010 issued an executive order 13547, in which it was clearly stated that EBM should be the foundational approach to address the conservation, economic activity, users' conflict, and sustainable use of ecosystem services across all the different sectors. And then in 2013, the National Ocean Council uh, developed a uh, National Ocean Policy Implementation Plan that basically describes what will be the specific actions that will be required by federal agency in order to, to address the, all the different key challenges for ocean, coastal, and uh, Great Lakes uh, management by adopting an EBM strategy, of course. And uh, as part of this effort, uh, uh, it was um, develop an uh, interagency EBM uh, subgroup that is charged with providing policy advice on uh, the EBM strategies and uh, also technical repre representation from uh, all the different federal agencies that are members of the NOC. And also in 2013 uh, it was issued uh, guidelines from uh, Europe, the um, Ocean Research Advisory Panel in which basically uh, it was um, clearly said that there was a need for clarity and understanding of what are the EBM concept, practices, and principles across all the different uh, participatory groups. And also, more recently, the, the NOC or, uh, developed an implementation plan and, uh, the, in 2015. And at the bottom of this slide, uh, you can have a, a Here's the link where you can find those information and also for the information from the planner report that will be uh, made available in 2016. And uh, within this plan and report also was discussed uh, the, what are the particular um, or the EBM um, components or the effort toward uh, the EBM uh, components of all the different federal agencies and basically uh, provide information for uh, leadership and collaboration and uh, scientific framework uh, and overall those information should uh, improve the decision making process and also they were uh, requiring uh, the identification of an uh, example for a pilot project in which EBM uh, can be uh, used and uh, implemented. <clears throat> so with this idea the, we had two main uh, objectives for uh, this study. The, First one was to provide, uh, first of all, an overview of what is the current state of uh, practice among several uh, different uh, federal programs in the United States that employ or adopt uh, uh, EBM components or approaches for the management of ocean, coastal zone, and uh, Great Lakes res uh, resources. And the second objective was to identify gaps in knowledge or implementation strategies to enhance overall the uh, EBM framework that they use. 
And to do that, we uh, developed a questionnaire that was distributed to all the different federal agencies that are member of the NOC. That was based on uh, 21 questions uh, requesting information about key topic areas of EDM, but also we ask respondent uh, uh, more general information about the program, particularly specifically the name of the program, in which federal agency the program is conducted, also the geographic location and special scope of the program. And also we ask respondent to provide a, a short description of the program and the program activities. And based on this description, we included each program in uh, four main subcategories, which are uh, included in the first row of the table in this slide. So we have the science and research program, resource management extractive users program, resource management non-extractive users program, and mission driven program. And uh, in the next slide, I will provide a better definition of the criteria that we use to include each program in uh, one of those four subcategories that we included in the analysis. And uh, as I said, we ask respondent specific question about, uh, for example, the um, several topic areas of EBM. Specifically, we ask them uh, e uh, what type of audience the program was directed to, for example, if it was uh, internal to agency or was directed to where other federal managers or uh, academia, public, uh, and so on. What type of partners uh, the program had uh, developed and uh, if they had memo signed memorandum of understanding, uh, what type of memorandum of understanding, for example, if it was we signed with other federal uh, agency or uh, state agency, NGO, and uh, so forth. We asked respondent about the, if they have developed training material and what type of training material, uh, if they develop products, specific products on EBM, and uh, what type of products. And also we provided them uh, uh, with a list of uh, EBM uh, best management and practices and principles. That for a matter of uh, just space, we didn't include in this presentation, but you can contact us and uh, we can provide you a list of those uh, principles and uh, best management practices. Or you can download directly the paper that was published in Marine Policy is actually open source, so you can just download it. It's free to download. <coughs> and uh, also, uh, yeah, this is the um, criteria that we use to include the program in um, to develop the, the categories that we included in the analysis. We started with two overarching categories, which are the one in the green boxes. So on the left, uh, we have the management program, and on the right, uh, no management programs. And we included the uh, with, for management programs, were included programs that uh, have a primary effort to focus on the management and stewardship of natural resources for the common good. And no management programs were considered those programs whose effort is focused on uh, provi uh, providing information to advance the management and stewardship of natural resources. But their primary goal was not the direct management of those resources. And then we divided each of these uh, two categories in uh, a total of four uh, main uh, subcategories, which are included in the red boxes. So management programs were uh, divided in uh, Resource Management Extractive Users Program and Resource Management Non-Extractive Users Program. Uh, Resource Management Extractive Users Program were considered as those programs um, prime, uh, that provide leadership and coordination for the management of natural resources through activities that have a primary emphasis on the extractive or consumptive use of uh, those resources. And at the bottom, in the yellow boxes, you can see examples of activities that might be conducted by those programs. So for example, fishing and aquaculture, or uh, offshore energy development, mineral extraction, or uh, uh, mitigation and planning. Non, uh, the second subcategory is resource management non-extractive users, in which we include a program that provides uh, leadership and coordination for the management of uh, natural resources, but the main uh, focus was on activities that have a primary emphasis on the uh, 
protection of those uh, or, uh, resources. And therefore, example of activities conducted by those programs were uh, protection of marine, coastal, and uh, estuarine protected areas and national sanctuaries, or uh, protection of species, prote protection of uh, resources from the threat of uh, oil spills, restoration project of development and implementation of adaptation. And then on the right side, the no management programs were divided into subcategories, science and research program, and mission driven program. Science and research program basically are programs that have a primary emphasis on advancing the scientific information about TBM. An example of the, the activities conducted by those programs are, uh, for example, stock assessment, or uh, trophic web uh, studies, or uh, climate impact assessment, uh, and so forth. And the last group was uh, the mission-driven program, which were considered as those programs that provide stewardship uh, for the program's own resource. And therefore, uh, they conduct activities that are guided by specific challenges and uh, project demands. And an uh, example of activities conducted by those programs might be marine, coastal, and uh, estuarine infrastructure development, military uh, operation and training, or balanced water management system, or room making, regulating investment technology and operation. Now, I want to point out that maybe there were, um, it could happen, I mean, if a program was included in one subcategory, that doesn't imply that the program is just focusing on that particular activity. The, uh, we concentrated just based on the definition that they provided about their activities on the majority of activities that the program was conducting. Therefore, there might be chances in which a specific program could have been included in the science and research subcategories or in uh, research management non-extractive users categories. But if the majority of the activity were included, for example, in science and research, uh, we included the program in the science and research subcategories. And finally, we ask program to self-score themselves their activities based on how well those are uh, activities aligns with the actual working definition of EBM developed by the NOP that is also adopted by the uh, including the ORAP guidelines in 2013 which I'm going to read here, that TBM is an integrated approach to resource management that considers the entire ecosystems, including humans. It requires managing ecosystem as a whole instead of separately managing their individual components or users. TBM considers all the elements that are integral to ecosystem functions and accounts for economic and social benefits, as well as environmental stewardship concerns. It also recognizes that ecosystems are not defined or constrained by political boundaries. The concept of EBM is underpinned by sound science and adaptive management as information or changing conditions present new challenges and opportunities. And uh, respondents were required to use a Liger scale from 0 to 5, with a 0 if the uh, program activities uh, do not encompass this definition uh, of EBM at all or five uh, if the program activity perfectly matched this definition. And for the analysis, uh, for the program self-scoring, we use a series of uh, non-parametric tests, such as the Kruskal Wallis uh, single factor ANOVA, uh, pairwise with Coxon test with Bonferroni correction. Actually, we have to use non-parametric tests mainly because we had uh, an uneven number of uh, programs for each of the four uh, subcategories. Therefore, we couldn't have uh, uh, almost shade elasticity, it's a hard word to say, or uh, basically um, normal distribution. And also we conducted a series of uh, permutation uh, t-test with 10,000 permutation to increase the level of independence uh, to test the hypothesis of uh, significant non-random differences uh, between program type and between national regional program. Uh, for each specific EBM topic areas that we uh, request information for. And also we use a series of uh, social network analysis uh, methodologies, mainly to explore uh, the relation uh, in the program, uh, among program similarities in the, all the different EBM uh, topic areas. And uh, on the left, uh, you can see at the bottom an example of what is a network and a, so and a network 
social network. For those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, basically the nodes in our case will be the program, and the link between nodes will be the uh, level of similarities uh, uh, between one program and another program uh, for different topic areas, of course, EBM topic areas. And specifically, we, lo uh, we look at uh, particular metrics that are called cohesion metrics. Basically, we were looking at how cohesive was the network and uh, the network of the program similarities. Basically, because uh, we assume that the more cohesive is the, is the network, uh, the more flow of information potentially can flow through the nodes, which is a proxy of the fact that for that particular EBM topic areas, the program, including the analysis, were performing good. And uh, specifically, we were looking at two cohesion metrics, density and fragmentation. The density, as it might be easy to realize, just look at how dense is a network. And therefore, it can go from 0 to 1. The more dense is the network, therefore, the more cohesive is the network. And the better that network is from an EBM perspective. Fragmentation is uh, uh, the opposite. The more fragmented is a network, the less cohesive is the network. And also, we conduct a series of permutation tests uh, using the QAP correlation, which is a quadratic assignment procedure. procedure. Uh, I'm not going too much in detail what is a QAP correlation, but basically, we're looking at the correlation uh, between matrices of uh, program similarities for uh, two specific topic areas. So for example, if we did found uh, significant positive correlation for the matrix of uh, the type of audience and the type of partnership, that means the programs that are more similar in the type of audience that they adopted for the program tend also to be more similar in the type of partners that they develop. And those are the descriptive results. We included in the analysis uh, a total of 62 programs that are actually conducted in uh, 13 uh, different agencies and bureaus uh, of, uh, of the National National Council. And on the left is a, a table that provides a list for all those different, different agencies and bureaus. Now, we want to point out that uh, we acknowledge the fact that this is not a complete census of all uh, the uh, federal uh, the program that, at the federal level, that use or adopt an EBM framework or component. But at the same time, we think that 62 is a fairly reasonable high number that can provide us at least some uh, information about potential path. And for the programs that we included in the analysis, if we look at the original uh, scope of the program, the majority of them were nationwide in scope. I think we're about 28 programs. And then we fewer number, we have program conduct on the West Coast. Uh, eight program conducted on the near Northeast Atlantic. Uh, seven program were conducted on the Great Lakes, uh, and then uh, four program were conducted at international level, and then two programs in Alaska, two program in the Pacific Island, uh, Southeast Atlantic, and the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. Also, the majority of programs that we included in the analysis were uh, resource management extractive users program. 42%, while 13% were resource management non-extractive users program. Therefore, 55% of the programs, including the analysis, were resource management program, while about 45-46% were included in the ca categories of the non-management program, divided in 27% as science and research program, and 18% as mission-driven programs. Those are uh, the results from the how programs self-score themselves, and uh, the box plot, uh, uh, the median, uh, the, the horizontal bar at the center of the box uh, represent the median value of uh, the program self-scoring, and the numbers at the bottom of each program uh, category represent the uh, here represent the total number of programs uh, that were included in this category for an analysis. Therefore, we have uh, 11 programs uh, considered as mission-driven, 26 as uh, uh, extractive users, uh, 8 
non-extractive uses and uh, 17 as uh, science and research. So overall, it looks like the mission-driven programs are the ones that self-perceive themselves as aligning less with the working definition of the EBM used by the NOF and the OROP. <coughs> Sorry. And in general, it looks like uh, management ex uh, resource management pro uh, program, which are extractive users and non-extractive users, were actually uh, the programs that self-perceive themselves with the highest value, equal to 5. And based on these results, we actually conducted a further test with a permutation t-test, again with 10,000 permutations. In this case, on the two mode matrices of uh, program similarities. To test the hypothesis, the management programs at a higher degree centrality than no management programs for each of the specific EBM topic areas that we analyze. And uh, the degree centrality is basically another measure how <coughs> how the uh, program is central within the network. And therefore, the highest uh, is the, the centrality of a node, in our case, a program within the network. The more important uh, is that program within the network. And actually, the results provided evidence that uh, there was a higher degree, significant higher degree centrality of management programs compared to no management program. But just for the uh, EBM topic areas of uh, EBM best management practices and principle. Principle. And the reason is that uh, mainly because the management programs were actually using uh, uh, a wider, a larger number of those uh, best management practices and principles compared to no management programs. And in fact, if we look at this result with this uh, histogram that shows on the x-axis all the different uh, EBM best management practices that we uh, provided them, the list of all the different practices that we provided them, and on the y-axis, the percentage of uh, use of those uh, uh, each of these um, best management practices by program categories, the research management programs would actually use a wider uh, number, larger number of those practices. If, if we average by subcategories, the resource management extractive users were using an average of 87.4%. Uh, decreased to 82.5% for resource management non-extractive users programs. And these average decrease for no management programs. Specifically, 72.2% for science and research programs and 63.6% for uh, mission-driven programs. And also, if we look at the range of uh, the best management practices, the ones that were used the most across all type of programs where those three, ecosystem uh, science, promote understanding uh, and integrate scientific and uh, socioeconomic data with an average of 92.3% uh, across all programs, including the analysis. And on the other side of the spectrum, the best management practices that were used the less was assess human dimensions with an average of 65.8%. Similarly, for the EBM principle, again, the results show that management programs are using, using actually a larger number of those principles. And if we average those, it would be 87.6% for uh, resource management extractive users programs, 84.7% for resource management non-extractive users program, and then it decreases to 70.6% for a science and research program and 67.7% for mission-driven programs. And then the EBM principle that we use the most across all type of programs was uh, ecosystem resilience with an average of 92.7%. And the one that was used the last was uh, sustainable use with an average of 78.0%. Now, those are the results for the cohesion measure of the network in program similarities. And this is an example uh, of the network that we analyze. Uh, this is the one for the type of memorandum of understanding that the program signed. And on the right, there is a, 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 just a table that can provide information on how to read this network. Basically, again, the node of the network represents the programs. 
the shape of the node uh, is based on uh, the type of program, the for a circle for a science and research program, triangles for resource management extractive uses programs, diamonds for a resource management non-extractive uses program, and square for uh, mission-driven programs. And the color of the node of the program is based on the geographic, uh, um, where the program is conducted on a geographic scale. For example, red is for uh, programs that are nationwide in scope. And uh, in this network, the uh, shape, that means the size of the node is based on uh, between a centrality of the program, which is another measure of the centrality of the node within the network, while the link, uh, the, the lines that go from one node to the other, the thickness of the line is uh, actually based on uh, uh, how similar are the program. Therefore, the more similar are, the more uh, thick will be the line. And uh, just for a matter of uh, visualization purposes, to make the visualization easier, here the relationship for the line was based on a 55% threshold, which means that you can find here lines that are only if two programs are at least 55% or more similar for the type of memorandum of understanding that they sign. But the result that I want you to look at is basically the density and fragmentation because this is the, actually was the network that was the le less cohesive. You can see that the fragmentation was fairly, fairly high, almost 0.8, and the density was pretty low, 0.1. The main reason is that uh, there were 32 isolates which means that there were 32 programs that did not sign any type of memorandum of understanding, and they actually are not included in the visualization, which means that half of the program that we included in the analysis did not sign a, a memorandum of understanding. Also, another program that we would like to look at the result was the type, uh, the one for the type of training, which is included here. Again, the level of fragmentation is fairly high, less than the one for the random understanding, but uh, still fairly high, 0.5. And even the uh, density is fairly low, 0.3. Again, because it, because there are like uh, uh, 19 uh, isolates, which means that actually uh, almost two-thirds of the programs did not uh, have any training material on EDM. And on the other end, uh, the network that showed the uh, highest level of uh, cohesiveness were the ones for the type of partners, which is the one included in the, here that you can see, and the one for the EBM best management practices and principle. You can see that the fragmentation is zero, and also the uh, density is uh, really high, particularly for best management practices and principle is pretty much almost equal to one. And again, this is due to the fact that uh, we uh, distributed this questionnaire to programs that are already using uh, or uh, adopting EBM uh, framework and strategies. Therefore, it shouldn't come as a surprising result that they were using a really high number of best management practices and principles. Uh, now, those are the results for the co-op correlations. Again, uh, to read this table, basically, we have to look at um, the similarities in the matrices for the two EVM topic areas. So, for example, if we look at the first row, the audience has a significant positive correlation with the type of memorandum of understanding, 0.12, which means that programs that are similar in the type of audience that they uh, adopted also will tend to have more similar type of memorandum of understanding sign. And uh, also, some of you may notice that those correlations, although significant, are uh, in the majority of cases fairly low. But usually, I mean, at least in social science, we actually look at if the test is significant. And sometimes, even if there is a correlation of 0.2 or 0.3, we consider it pretty good. Now, what is striked here is the correlation of 0.83 significant positive correlation between uh, the EBM best management practices and principle. And again, uh, this is because uh, programs were using a really high number of best management practices and principle. Therefore, uh, 
shouldn't come as a surprise that programs that are more similar in the type of principle that they adopt will also use a similar type of uh, EDM principles. Uh, but also the type of audience, if we look at the, for the last two columns, for the EDM best management practices and principle, the only significant positive correlation uh, was with the type of audience, 0.14. And this is an indication that the type of audience is actually the main driver the shape which EBM best management practices and principle uh, each program will decide to employ. Also looks like a similar type of partners and uh, audience can potentially lead to more memorandum of understanding. We look at uh, the type of partners have a correlation of 0.18 uh, with the type of memorandum of understanding, which was very significant. And uh, for the type of audience, was 0.12 with the type of memorandum of understanding. Conversely, if we look at the type of memo, uh, the type for memorandum of understanding, looks like uh, those can generate more similar products as well, and also more similar type of product uh, products and uh, uh, type of partner can potentially lead to uh, similar training if we look at those correlations. And uh, how to uh, discuss the results? First of all, we want to point out that there are several, many different uh, paths to ecosystem-based management. And uh, that doesn't mean that necessarily one is better than the other. Because again, we said that EBM is a dynamic, adaptive, and iterative process that changes based on the spatial scale of the project and according to what are the uh, the goals and objectives of each uh, agency and program that changes. But nevertheless, we did found that, uh, at least for the programs that we analyzed for uh, our analysis, more federal programs that actually implement EBM uh, uh, approaches operate at uh, national level, are more national wide in scope. But in general, also we found that no, uh, no management programs are those that perceive themselves as aligning less with the working definition of EDM adopted by the NOP and the OREP. Therefore, if we want to uh, a larger discussion for EBM and in EBM implementation, probably no management program definitely should be the one that should be engaged the most. And uh, But in general, all programs employ a relatively high number of uh, best management practices and principles, but at the same time, some of those uh, management uh, principles and practices should be used more, particularly assess human dimension is one that is, uh, for the best management practices, used the less. And therefore, these highlight the importance to increase the level of communication for the importance of uh, social science and uh, human dimension components within any BM framework or strategy. And also, there seems to be a need for more interagency or uh, partner uh, agreements, for example, through the adoption of the uh, uh, memorandum of understanding. And uh, probably a good way, we argue that a good way to uh, enhance the level of communication would be to try to understanding uh, or developing training material. But at the same time, we acknowledge that there actually are some existing training material that uh, the majority of programs are already using particularly the one, the programs that are nationwide in scope. And for example, this is the two mode network for the program similarities for the type of training. And basically you can see that there are actually three fundamental uh, type of training material. On the upper right, we have online training material in the form of uh, online tools and uh, handbooks. <coughs> Sorry. And then we have in-person training material in the form of a workshop uh, and uh, classes. And finally, other type of uh, unspecified uh, material. So for example, program 57, which is a square, so it's a mission-driven program, uh, nationwide scope, is color in red, is actually using all different type of training materials. Perhaps program, uh, I think it's 33, mm -hmm. which again is a mission-driven program, nationwide in scope. My 
engage in a communication with Program 57 to try to understand how to develop maybe in-person training material that might be specific for its goal and objectives. Or the same for other type of programs that are nationwide scope by a different uh, uh, effort. That means that this uh, uh, training material might be can increase cross-sectoral partnership, interdisciplinary collaboration, and overall the level of communication among all of these uh, different programs. What are the challenges and uh, opportunities? Um, first of all, we have to say that improving EBM uh, is among still among uh, all the different federal agencies is not something that can happen uh, overnight. I mean, it's a long-term iterative process. But in the long term, uh, adopting EDM strategies and a framework enhances the level of collaboration, uh, leverages opportunities, it reduces chances for litigation in the future, and overall improves the decision-making process. Also, we think that it is important to work with different partners and stakeholders because this is a, a, an effective way to uh, enhance efficient uh, EDM. And for example, this can be done by drawing for the experiences of other programs. Uh, particularly, this can increase the level of education, partnership uh, across programs, the level of training for uh, each specific program, and uh, how they are involved in EDM approaches. And, uh, but also for the future, we need to explore the understanding of the less employed EDM uh, best management practices and principles, particularly the ones that are used the less such as, for example, assess human dimension. And we also need to look at regional example of uh, what is considered a, uh, a successful uh, EDM implementation. But at the same time, we need the next step will be also to try to understand what are the motivation and behavior of each specific program. For example, why a program uh, decided to partner with a specific type of partners but not with others. Maybe behind that there are specific uh, motivations that maybe this uh, analysis that is not able to capture. And also we still need to define, uh, uh, come up with metrics or performance measure that can clarify how we can define a successful EBM uh, strategy or framework. And with this we would like to acknowledge all uh, the different uh, partners of this group, uh, which are on the federal agency of the National Ocean uh, Council. And we want to thank uh, Jason Link, uh, Rebecca Shafford, uh, who helped us to provide comments for the paper. And uh, personally, I would like to thank the National Sea Grant that provided me support during my CNAUS fellowship when I conducted this study. And we would like to, before to go to uh, ask the question, uh, provide you a little bit of uh, next step. What are we going to do next? So the results of this analysis will actually be presented also at the ISSAO workshop, uh, uh, which is going to be uh, tomorrow or uh, this week in uh, Copenhagen in uh, Denmark. Also, we are going to present the results at the Ocean Sciences meeting in New Orleans. Uh, next month, and also there is actually a, a National Ocean Council uh, annual uh, working plan and also a long-term plan that uh, to which these uh, results are going to be considered. <clears throat> and uh, also we would like to um, uh, invite you to look at the uh, fairly recent uh, EBM page in the, within the NOAA uh, webpage. This is the link that you can uh, go to that provides information uh, EBM in marine and coastal environment. Uh, uh, valuable link and resources is also a 101 uh, EBM uh, information of what is, it, what is EBM and uh, in which uh, area or region is uh, actually uh, adopted. And also there are links to our contacts if you want to contact us for uh, further information. Or if you have further questions, you are uh, more than welcome to contact us. Thank you, and I uh, think we have time for questions. Yes, all right. Thank you so much. Um, 
Uh, well, that, this is a great presentation, Andrea. We're, we're very glad to get it. Um, I would just go ahead and invite anyone who had any questions. You can type them in on the question panel uh, or raise your virtual hand. We don't. Uh, you're obviously very thorough because we don't currently have any questions. Um, I would. One thing I was curious about. Um, were there? Have you seen anything similar from any other countries or regions uh, undertaking any sort of similar analysis, looking broad scale at at EBM impl implementation? Um, uh, Sarah, this is Peg. Um, the um, FAO workshop, ICS and FAO workshop that's underway this week. Um, is intended to focus in on operationalizing EBM, where they're using ecosystem approaches, EA. Um, leading up to that workshop, they uh, sent a, a very brief survey out to the attendees of that workshop. So they are in the process of gathering input, um, albeit I, I think it's going to be a much broader audience of, from the scientific community as well as maybe some um, agency folks from within the EU community and other uh, countries. Um, that was sort of the first time I had actually seen a tool uh, somewhat similar to the tool we use for the questionnaire, but certainly not as detailed as, as the questionnaire that was developed by our team. Um, I believe there have been other assessments, um, but that's the most recent one that I'm aware of, and, and I think that I'm not sure how those uh, results will be made evident, but uh, we're going to track that work that's uh, being done by the ICES and FAO work group. Okay. All right. Thank you, Peg. Um, we have one question that come in. Um, uh, so it's a great presentation. Can you give me the two examples of how EBM is being applied in Alaska? <laughs> well, actually, call me out guard. Uh, I don't remember all the different programs specific. Uh, yeah, Sarah, there, there were 62 uh, programs okay. that are Fair in enough. the database, and so I, I think uh, at this point we'd be hard pressed to kind of come up and, you know, respond directly on each yeah. one of them. I mean, if you're interested, I mean, you can, can contact us, and we can provide. Yeah, but like not necessarily in the specific program, but a bit larger context. Uh, as many of you know, in parallel, there is a, a strat national strategy for the high Arctic that has been developed. And the lead on that is the Department of Interior, but a number of other agencies are involved. And one of the principles of that strategy is um, uh, ecosystem approaches to management. So it's, it's fairly similar to EBM, but in that case, it stretches across the land ocean boundary. And so that's the primary uh, place I would reference those who are interested in EBM activities in Alaska. Okay, but okay, great. Sarah, we, we can also uh, follow up if, uh, and respond yeah. to folks if they have uh, key questions about any of the 62 programs, because there's certainly quite a bit of data. That you're, you're seeing results uh, presented, you know, from, from a section of the data, but we do have a lot more data um, embedded in that uh, database. Okay, um, and the questioner said that she certainly understands. Um, okay, well, we don't have any other questions right now. Um, it was just a very thorough uh, presentation on the analysis. So I, we're, I just wanted to conclude by saying we're really, really glad you guys could come and present today. Um, and it, was, it was very interesting to get this update. You rarely see such a high-level view of, of how things are going, and so we appreciate you. Uh, speaking about it. Um, I'd like to thank everyone also who was here today. Um, we appreciate you coming and uh, please check out some of our future webinars too uh, by signing up for the EBM Tools Network or the Open Channels mailing lists. So again, uh, on Andrea, Peg, and Frank, thank you so much for coming. And well, thank you, Sarah, thank you. and to your network for allowing us to present. That's great. Uh, this is Frank, Sarah. One, one last uh, commercial here. For people on the uh, call or on the webinar who are planning to be at the Ocean Sciences meeting, we do have a session. Uh, unfortunately, it's Friday, so you have to stick around. But uh, we have both an oral session and a poster session where we are looking at both uh, U.S. and international examples of ecosystem-based management, trying to tie together uh, a number of, of 
concepts with that and linking it to ecosystem services. So we have a number of really good presentations, both uh, poster and oral, at that meeting. Uh, there are also some plans to put together a, a, a roundtable to talk with some of our academic partners on how we're moving forward on EBM and ecosystem services, too. So I hope uh, to see some of you at the Ocean Science. Okay, great, Frank. And on that note, um, as everyone can see right now, there's uh, all of their contact information. I'll give everybody another second to jot any down, and I hope uh, there'll be some communication with you guys in the future. Okay, all right. Uh, well, bye, everyone. I hope you have a, a wonderful rest of your day, and, and best wishes for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.